Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're now recording this and we're going to make it available for further uh, viewing afterwards. We have a friend in Los Angeles who works in uh, alternative media there, and he's going to air this show on some of the platforms that he has access to in Los Angeles. So we're excited about that. We're coming together at a very dangerous moment, as you all know. Uh, Joe Biden, just in the last couple of days, has talked about uh, we're getting ready to head towards Armageddon. Uh, and then uh, Zelensky in uh, Ukraine has been calling for preemptive nuclear strikes inside of Russia. Uh, and then early this morning, you might have heard that the Ukrainian uh, Kiev terrorist outfit has uh, tried to blown up, tried to blow up the Crimean Bridge. They were successful in taking out one lane and one railroad track, but already the Russians have uh, got uh, one lane open again and, and one railroad track open as well. But clearly, we're facing World War III right now, and so we really appreciate you coming on uh, on the uh, on this. Uh, uh, talk. Uh, it's going to last for 90 minutes. Uh, Will Griffin uh, is our tech person. He's uh, one of the board members in the Global Network. He's an Iraq war and Afghanistan veteran. We're grateful to Will for his uh, support. Uh, after each of our speakers are finished, we're going to have a question and answer time. Uh, so uh, be prepared for that. And uh, let me just review the order of speakers. Uh, the uh, chair or uh, uh, of our uh, Global Network Board uh, is Dave Webb from Leeds, England. He's going to go first with a PowerPoint presentation, giving an overview of the uh, space issue. And then following him will be Agneta Norberg from Stockholm, Sweden. And then, and then will be Kuhan Peck Mander from Hawaii. And then Sabrata Gasroy. Uh, a citizen from India, but who lives in Boston will then speak. And then Tamara Lorenz from uh, Canada. So Dave, uh, when you're ready, uh, please begin. And thanks again to everybody. Okay, thank you. I'll just share my screen. I hope you can see that, okay. Um, Okay, so to illustrate uh, why we urgently need to keep space for peace, I'd like to take a look at the increase in dangers to space and the Earth, as highlighted here, that have happened mostly in the last year. This will be mainly from the US because we get more information from there, but also because the US is a major force driving others to follow with similar developments. A new space race is underway, driven by military and commercial interests, and it's accelerating. Satellites are getting smaller and cheaper to build and launch, and there are now so many everyday applications for them, as you can see here. Communications, broadcasting, finance, weather, and much more. And government spending is increasing, and the US government is outspending everyone else. And a major driver of the increased levels of government spending in space is the race for military dominance. The US military continues to warn of the dangers of Chinese and, mili and Russian military space programs, but it neglects to mention that the US is doing the same thing and spending far more than anyone else on space activities. Space Force now operates US military satellites and to help coordinate the requirements of the US Army, Navy and Marine Corps. The Pentagon is developing a military internet in space made up of military and commercial satellites with a new space end crypto unit to help protect the network from cyber attacks, jamming and other electronic interference. The Space Operations Command at Peterson Space Force Base in Colorado has a unit called Space Delta-6 to develop cyber warfare techniques and support military satellites. And Space Force also has a unit called Delta-9 established in July 2020, 
which is developing the secretive X-37B military space plane. There is also a new unit called Space Delta 18, which acts as the National Space Intelligence Center. It was activated in June to provide intelligence on threats, intentions and activities in space, and it's working to establish a national test and training complex to create accurate digital training environments for space wargaming. Currently, Space Force does not have an interest in activities beyond the Earth's orbit. Of course, that may change, but there are others who are already looking at the possibilities of using nuclear energy to power deep space missions, bases on the Moon and Mars, and the mining of the planetary bodies. And Aerospace Corporations, the nuclear industry, and Space Force are looking at nuclear powered satellites as a way of either dodging space weapons or perhaps powering them. GN board member Carl Grossman continues to point out that the new space race is going nuclear and that the US is pouring money into the development of space nuclear power, despite the possible dangers of catastrophic launch failures and the effects of pollution on Earth and of space objects. NATO's 2019 space policy recognized space as a new operational domain, making it equally as important as air, land, sea, and cyberspace. In October 2020, the NATO Space Center was established at Allied Air Command in Ramstein, Germany. And at the 2021 Brussels summit, NATO recognized that attacks to, from, or within space could lead to the implementation of Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, which states that, an attack against one NATO member is considered as an attack against all members. So a cyber or space attack could be considered an act of war. Other international military partnerships include Space Forces Operation Olympic Defender, which was established to deter common adversaries and hostile acts in space, and a combined space operations initiative in which the US partners include Australia, Canada, France, Germany, New Zealand, and the UK. They are working together to improve cooperation, coordination, and interoperability opportunities. And these military alliances include collaboration across a range of activities, such as countering, determining, deterring, denying, or defeating hostile acts or interference. It's clear that they are aimed mostly at Russia and China. The increased activity in space is causing problems with overcrowding and debris. Different types of orbits are used for different satellite roles, as shown here. And it's the low Earth orbit region that has seen the biggest impact in recent years because it's used for communication, observation and surveillance. As of April 2022, there were nearly 5,500 operational satellites in orbit around the Earth and 4,700 of them were in low Earth orbit. And these numbers are set to increase rapidly. Private companies such as SpaceX, OneWeb and Amazon, and state-owned companies such as China SatNet are setting up mega constellations and proposing to imminently increase the total number of satellites by 65,000. Altogether, over 100,000 have been proposed in the next few years to develop faster and more global network services, including 5G for commercial and military use. All these new space objects generate a range of issues. Satellites can leave visible tracks in the night sky and mega constellations are interfering with the work of a professional astronomers. The overcrowding of low earth orbit is also leading to near, miss, uh, near misses and collisions in space. Satellites in this region typically have lifetimes of seven to 10 years, after which they become debris. As debris increases, collisions become more likely, creating more debris. The self-sustaining cascade of collisions could eventually result in a cloud of debris that rockets may not be able to penetrate, confining us to Earth. And this has become known as the Kessler syndrome. 
satellites no longer being used can also be deorbited and burn up traveling through the atmosphere. However, this creates a shock wave and leaves behind chemicals that can change the chemistry of the upper atmosphere and damage the, low, the ozone layer. In February, 40 of 49 satel Starlink satellites launched a week before were burnt up in the atmosphere as the result of a geomagnetic storm. The storm caused the atmosphere to warm and expand, increasing the density at low orbital altitudes. The resulting atmospheric drag led to the deorbiting of new arrivals. And in August, large pieces of space debris from a SpaceX mission were found in snowy mountains in New South Wales. Reports matched a SpaceX spacecraft which re-entered the Earth's atmosphere in July, months after being launched in November 2020. The spacecraft was seen breaking up about the area of Australia where the debris was found, and the re-entry was seen and heard for miles around. In September, space debris was also used to, to said to be responsible for the brilliant fireball that was seen in the north of the UK. But it isn't just re-entry of satellites that causes environmental problems. Launch accidents are not that uncommon. And when they occur, they create a considerable amount of environmental destruction and contamination. Even if successfully launched, rocket, rockets pollute the atmosphere, damaging the ozone layer and adding to climate change. Many of these effects are being ignored or brushed away. Some companies claim they use zero carbon green fuels, but the heat from rocket exhausts can produce nitrous oxide, a major contributor to climate change from atmospheric nitrogen. In addition, in addition pesticides used to grow the so-called carbon neutral biofuels pollute the land and the fuel must be processed, requiring a non-zero carbon footprint. The increase in satellite launches is being accompanied by a proliferation of spaceports from which to launch them. This map shows the current global distribution of spaceports, but in the rush to cash in on the poorly regulated space boom, space corporations are promising income and jobs to communities if they agree to host new spaceports. A recent edition of the GN Space Alert reported on sites in Indonesia, Guyana, New Zealand and the United Kingdom and the United States, and others have joined since. Many communities are not taken in by the promises made by their object, but their objections are largely overruled. And spaceport construction proposals are usually initiated or supported by one of the more larger space corporations keen to, to be able to launch small satellites for military and or commercial interests. People need to know the truth about what the real repercussions might be on their local communities. In the UK, a report called For Heaven's Sake, recently launched by CND and Drone Wars UK, outlines the role the UK is playing in the militarization of space. In its 2021, annual report, the UK Ministry of Defence stated that space is fundamental to military operations and underpins our ability to undertake the majority of defence tasks. In April, the commanders of the US and UK space commands signed an enhanced space cooperation memorandum of understanding to improve coordination and interoperability in order to maintain freedom of action in space, optimise resources, and enhance mission assurance and resilience. And further discussions are being held to further strengthen this partnership. Such agreements do not bode well for keeping space for peace. And now is the time for all of us to call for an examination into the consequences of the growing military and commercial space races. Meanwhile, SpaceX and Rocket Lab USA have entered into a cooperative research and development agreement with the US Transportation Command to support the Air Force's rocket cargo project, which is to deliver military equipment around the world as fast as possible. The war in Ukraine has drawn attention to the use of commercial satellites to track troop movements and monitor the impact of attacks. The US and UK have pumped billions of dollars worth of arms and equipment 
into the Ukrainian army to keep the war going, and arms companies are more than keen to oblige. Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov has openly offered Ukraine as a venue to test NATO weapons against Russia and as a testing ground for a US war with China. General John W. Raymond, head of space operations at US Space Force, has said that the aerospace industry has helped Kiev each and every day. Classified and commercial US satellites have provided Ukraine with intelligence on Russian troop movements and SpaceX has delivered 15,000 Starlink satellite internet kits to Ukraine to help troops receive targeting information on Russian positions, although it now appears that the Russian Hirada 2 system has found ways to also disable ground to satellite connections as used by Starlink. Cyber attacks and signal jamming have been common activities as have the developments of countermeasures. The war has increased the use of drones, rockets, the electronic warfare in the battlefield. A small drone fitted with modern digital optics and a secure data link can give even the smallest combat unit a view of the battlefield and the ability to see ahead a mile or so behind enemy lines. The war in Ukraine has also been used to put missile defense back on the agenda. One focus has been developed the development of hypersonic missiles whose speed and maneuverability make them very difficult to detect and intercept. The US and China have already conducted several tests and Russia has reported that it used hypersonic missiles to destroy a Ukrainian weapons depot in March. So the US Missile Defense Agency is developing a constellation of hypersonic and ballistic tracking space sensor satellites to detect and intercept hypersonics as part of the next generation of infrared satellite system. Missile, <clears throat> missiles would be tracked along the satellite constellation and then passed to the satellites equipped with more advanced sensors that can provide targeting data for interceptors. Another addition to the US missile defense is a long range discrimination radar to be included as part of a significant upgrade amid a renewed nuclear war scare. It will also contribute to space domain awareness and enable space objects to be better identified. Also, Japan, South Korea and the US have used North Korea as an excuse for conducting a biennial ballistic missile defense exercise called Pacific Dragon in August off the coast of Hawaii. There's a real need for international cooperation and agreements to prevent further damage to the earth and space environment and to stop the military and commercial arms races. Unfortunately, neither the spirit nor the letter of the Outer Space Treaty is being taken seriously now, and space exploration has given way to exploitation. The UN open-ended working group on reducing space threats through norms, rules, and principles of responsible behaviors was convened in February this year, and the first and second sessions were held in May and September in Geneva. But will this be enough? Will it take too long to be meaningful? Nothing much has emerged so far, and huge steps are being taken too quickly to further militarize and weaponize space. The international community must engage now to ensure strategies are adopted to create a sustainable future on Earth and in space. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dave. Really excellent presentation as always. We're now gonna to move to Agneta Norberg from Sweden. And uh, each of the following speakers will speak for eight minutes. At six minutes, I'll jump in and just say two minutes left. So Agneta, please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, excuse, excuse me, how many minutes did you say? Eight minutes. Eight. 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 Oh my God! But Dave, he spoke longer, didn't he? <laughs> yes, he did. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Well, I'll start and see. Then you can say stop it. <clears throat> I don't want to talk that much about space. Some will be connected to space, as we have the worlds, 
I'm I'm from Sweden. If you didn't, did you say that? Yeah. I'm from Sweden. The neutral, non-aligned, peaceful little country up in the north, famous for almost everything. I think you should forget it. We have turned to be a warmongering, aggressive, really evil country in my understanding. <clears throat> Every day, every day in my media in Sweden is filled with stories about Russia's evil, about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which most probably will end up in attacking Sweden. They will come soon. So we have now applied for joining NATO because of these things going on in Ukraine. And very seldom or never, we are told about what happened in 2014, about the beginning of the whole tragedy and horror that was unfolding in Ukraine with 14,000 dead. Never before in my lifetime, I have witnessed such a nasty behavior from our media and political establishment, all parties. I vividly remember the beginning of the 50s when the Soviet Union lay in shambles and the, they rather soon started to scare us for the Russians are coming. The Russians are coming in the 50s. I was 15 years old in 1952. And I remember still how scared I was for the Russians. And in early 50s, Senator McCarthy depicted Soviet Union as a horrifying threat to us all. And his propaganda worked even in Sweden but the new onslaught on Russia is worse. Those who are benefiting from the new Cold War are arms factories. We know that Lockheed Martin, General Dynamic, General Electric, Boeing, Raytheon, and Swedish Saab and more. One of the bosses for these warmongering when the war in Ukraine started was in TV this spring in Sweden and openly expressed his satisfaction over this wonderful opportunity to sell weapons to Ukraine. Sweden has become a platform for training area for all kinds of NATO maneuvers, every type. In August this year, US 52 bombers Stratofortress trained dropping sharp living bombs in the North, or North European airspace test range in Sweden. The B-52 bombers came from North Dakota. They had flew all over the Atlantic to come to Sweden and train bombing in North European airspace test range in Sweden. And why did they come? Because the Swedish uh, general said the Russians are so dangerous, so you must come and train here rather soon. And they came to the north of Sweden. Swedish Minister of Defense, Stefan Hultqvist, was very satisfied over this visit and training, which is part of the security guarantees the US has offered to Sweden in front of Sweden joining NATO. North European airspace test range, NEAT, one third of our country is practically occupied by war training forces all year around. Numerous testing and training 
of drones, which are guided from satellites um, and weapon systems, US long range weapons, AMRAM. Two minutes left. Which is two minutes, space two minutes left. rocket. Am I supposed to finish now? Two minutes. Two minutes, oh my God. Then I can't, I wasn't prepared for that. I was prepared for a longer speech I had. I'm sorry. To end up with something positive, I will tell you that to make those dangerous exercises visible to the public, we eight women cut the fence at the place where they trained those airplanes a couple of years ago. And we crept under the fence and went in to the airfield and said, we carry the banner, it's enough. And we were put in front of court, of course, and we had to pay fines. And we should do more of this kind of resistance practically as we women did to with our bodies go in on the airfield and stand there. If we have been 800 instead of eight women, they, we would have been ob, uh, observed. But we are in a very dangerous time and the peace movement is split and very weak, sad to say. We are split in our country concerning Ukraine and it is a really, really difficult time we face in Sweden. Thank you. Thank you, Agneta. Uh, next up is Kuhan Peckmander from Hawaii. You're muted. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Great, thank you. So um, thanks for, for every, everyone. I come from Hawaii. I'm doing my talk on Pacific peoples and Pentagon robots, a clash of paradigms. You see US Congress cites China's swelling geopolitical influence as the reason to garrison the globe along with Russia's and it's pulling the world ever closer into a confrontation between nuclear superpowers, this time with China as well. As a result, a face-off has emerged between two formidable paradigms. On one side is the global war machine, and on the other side is the oceanic peoples of the Pacific and Asia, whose livelihoods and identities are inextricably linked with the well-being of the ocean. I come from the Pacific. One paradigm brings to bear the full necro power of toxic masculinity, the artificial intelligence, robots, nukes, hypersonic weapons, ubiquitous surveillance. In short, robot wars controlled from space. Indigenous islanders who have been invisibilized for far too long, they embody the other paradigm. They have been the caretakers of the ocean for millennia. For them, the ocean is sacrosanct and Mother Earth's limits of carrying capacity, geography and the cycles of nature must be honored for a, for a livable future. So now in response to the US arms race with China, oceanic voices are rising and they have been. The infrastructure to support robot space wars is being built over their islands and they are angry. This construction is killing reefs, forests, freshwater supplies, endangered species and rare ecosystems. This is a threat to all beings on the planet. In Hawaii for years, Native Hawaiians have been protesting the construction of an 18 story high telescope atop Mauna Kea, the largest mountain in the Pacific and the tallest in the world if you measure from the base of the ocean, from the ocean floor. Like the Jeju Islanders, they've gone to court, they've been arrested, they've camped out, 
sometimes in the in the snow and the wind atop atop the mountain their resistance movement continues to grow and it is expanding internationally the telescope claims that it will have no military function i believe this to be hogwash because the national science foundation is seriously considering pouring $800 million into the telescope's construction. That's about a third of the total cost. The NSF is hugely supported by the US Department of Defense. So one of its top priorities is to help develop the cyber infrastructure for waging robot wars in space. And when that happens, and it's well on its way to doing so, it will be a game-changing metamorphosis in warfare. Whereas the last century's War Command Center was at Pearl Harbor, this century's command center is in space, in the cloud. Mauna Kea is as strategic for the era of satellite warfare as Pearl Harbor was during the era of naval power. From the summit of Mauna Kea, the line of sight for surveillance of satellites and missiles is clear in all directions for an entire hemisphere. There is no better strategic spot for an NSF telescope or for the, the, a Space Force base. And that's why the Space Force is moving to the Pohakuloa training area, the largest bombing training site in the Pacific, located at the foot of Mauna Kea. But the Pearl Harborization of Mauna Kea will make the big island of Hawaii a premier target for any adversary on the planet, which is none too reassuring for those of us who call the big island home. The US has effectively inverted the sacredness of Hawaii for its own nefarious purposes. Native Hawaiians call Hawaii the pico or the belly button of the Pacific, the place of, the bir of birth. The Pentagon calls it headquarters for the Indo-Pacific Command. It is from the Indo-Pacific Command that the US casts its net of empire over the entire blue hemisphere, coercing islands in the Pacific and Asian nations to participate in its full on arms race with China. Needless to say, the weapons dealers couldn't be any happier over the idea of war with China. The money is in robot wars controlled from space. Only an adversary as distant and far and powerful as China can justify to Congress to green light the costly research and development of high ticket robot war items like smart missiles, unmanned submarines, remote control rocket launchers, modernized nukes, and all the al algorithms that go along with that. Two minutes. The okay, Two minutes. The all right, the operating system for AI driven war called the Joint All Domain, Domain Command and Control or the JADC2 will be overseen by the Space Force. The JADC2, which will be controlled from the cloud, will enable the networking together of unmanned lethal weapons and will render 20th century warfare unrecognizable. The goal is to give the US the ability to summon at once at any given moment, unmanned military forces to rain terror down on any spot in the world. A swarm of drones, a hypersonic missiles, unmanned submarine torpedoes, you name it, autonomous bombers, and all with the ease of calling an Uber. Military planners say that the era of unmanned warfare, in this era, victory is impossible without AI, artificial intelligence. They say AI eradicates the so-called time limitations of human, participa <clears throat> human participa participation. For example, the time between launch and strike of an incoming missile could be as brief as say six minutes. During that time, it is believed that humans would be prone to panic and would be unable to, to, to deal with the emotional response to an incoming attack, whereas machines would not. So this kind of um, machine decision-making does accelerate warfare, and it is plain to see how, as, how easily uh, conflict could escalate. In 2010, we saw how an analogous unintended escalation in the financial markets wiped over a trillion dollars off the stock market in minutes 
driven by trading algorithms feeding off each other in a dizzying spiral. Imagine if those algorithms were controlling not digital currency, but instead weapons of mass destruction. On the islands and in their surrounding waters, robot war experiments take place year round. Unmanned metal monsters are networked together in ghastly war fighting scenarios, decimating all creatures of the sea, great and small. Hi. But the people's movement for a peaceful Pacific will not die. Thank you. Great job, Kuan. Sorry to cut you off. Sorry to cut all of you off, but we want to leave time for people to ask questions and things like that. Next up is our dear friend, Sabrata Gashroy, who lives in Boston. Take it away, Sabrata, unmute yourself, please. You're muted. Can you unmute him, Will? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Maybe he needs to put on his headset again. Yeah, whatever you did undo uh, from what you did earlier, Subrata, I think uh, that just cut off your sound entirely. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry. Yeah. All right, you're back. We hear I, you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, sorry about the <laughs> glitch. Um, so um, uh, I'm supposed to talk about uh, the um, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy of the U U.S. Um, just do a quick um, uh, historical uh, overview, a uh, few remarks. Um, so it, uh, I don't need to tell uh, this uh, crowd that uh, U.S. global domination is based on projecting military power. A trillion dollar military budget, 800 military bases overseas, 1.4 million people in uniform, and um, numerous bilateral, multilateral military alliances across the globe. So right after the end of the war, meaning Second World War, U.S. was quick to form the first uh, military alliance focused on Europe and the Soviet Union, and that was the NATO, and it's now trying to expand to, uh, to the Pacific, uh, Indo-Pacific. In the, at that time, primarily the focus was Europe and containing the Soviet threat and then China uh, in, the, um, in the East and didn't talk too much about in, in the Pacific. And uh, so we saw then focused on China on, in the, in the Pacific, on the Pacific Ocean, a number of alliances that grew and hence the title of my brief remarks today is from ANZAS to the current quad. Now these are all Pentagonese uh, uh, acronyms. So ANZUS is is uh, <clears throat> New Zealand, Australia, New Zealand, and United States ANZUS, and it's a trilateral military uh, pact that um, uh, still exists today. And uh, in 1954. So this ANZUS was formed in 1951, right after NATO in 49. In 54, we have the birth of CETO, the Southeast Asia uh, Treaty Organization, um, and that was uh, focused on Southeast Asia to contain the Chinese threat, of course, but also coincident with the defeat of the French colonialists in Dien Bien Phu in 1954 in Vietnam. And, um, and, and interestingly, and I'll, I'll just point out, among the membership in this uh, group in, in CETO, there are only three members from Asia. It's Pakistan, Thailand, and the Philippines. The rest were all European former colonial powers, uh, Britain, uh, France, uh, of course, the US, and so forth. Uh, and then US formed sort of uh, not quite in Asia, but uh, uh, bordering 
on uh, West Asia and Iraq, uh, um, uh, uh, Turkey, and, and so forth. This, this was called a center. Center was formed in 1958 after uh, uh, what was called the Baghdad Pact. And interestingly enough, um, in this organization as well, Pakistan was a key player. So we have two US military formations, uh, CETO and CENTO, both that uh, Pakistan uh, played a role. And, um, and then there was sort of a hiatus in terms of these military alliances in the East as uh, Vietnam War ended in 1975 with the defeat and the US military kind of pulled back and, um, and they were talking about leaving um, the Pacific, but obviously they had um, other thoughts, but didn't form any major military alliances as the focus then switched back to Europe with uh, Reagan and then Bush uh, pushing uh, all their might against the evil empire, the, the Soviet Union. So in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, then the pivot started back to uh, Asia, and we see the birth of um, another alliance in uh, 2007, which is now it's called the Quad, which is the quadrilateral security dialogue between India, Japan, the United States, and uh, Australia. And um, in 2021, 20, 20, just the last year, we also saw a little bit of a tweaking between the U.S. relationship with Australia and, and, and Britain. It's called the AUKUS, Australia, uh, United Kingdom, and U.S. And this was based on this collaboration on uh, a nuclear-powered submarines that the French were uh, left out. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so we are seeing all these things happening. And then in uh, about 2007, when the um, uh, Quad was formed, the focus started become, being now on the, um, 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 Asia, I mean, not Asia uh, Pacific, but Indo-Pacific. And this, this terminology is basically the US uh, concoction. It's a whole bunch of countries that going from the US uh, Pacific Ocean West Coast to all the way to Japan and through India and uh, other other countries covering the the very um, in, uh, very important or critical uh, Indian Ocean uh, area and then uh, near uh, uh, Indonesia the Malacca Straits which control all the oil uh, shipment movement from uh, the Middle East to China so uh, the 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 focus now. The two uh, character uh, basic characteristics of this new focus of attention the Indo-Pacific is India, and then uh, of course China. So China two is minutes. given. China has okay. two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay. Um, so it, the basic strategy in the uh, Indo-Pacific, and and the U.S. actually has a published this thing. It's uh, you you can see this is the Indo. Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States. And this is a, a speech that Biden gave last year at the Quad uh, uh, leaders meeting. And I will only mention two things on this, that it, it has just a two legs. One is given, contain China, and the second is to integrate India into the US orbit. And it's very interesting, many things can be said about this particular dynamic, uh, India's integration into the U.S. orbit, and this has been going on since 1991, of course, the neoliberal policies that India adopted quickly after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the tremendous uh, influx of some American capital, but business interests and others in India that, um, that they want India to be the linchpin in their new strategy uh, against uh, China. So, of course, a lot can be said if people have questions about India's ambivalence and also embracing the U.S. Uh, orbit, um, I, can, I can maybe discuss a few things in the Q&A period. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrata. Please mute yourself now. Okay, next up, uh, the last person before questions is uh, Tamara Lorenz from Canada. And let me just say that if you have questions, uh, 
go ahead and put them in the uh, chat now or as we go along, and then uh, we'll uh, refer to those after Tamara uh, does her presentation. All right, go ahead, Tamara. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really nice to be with you all. I'm speaking to you from Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, the traditional territory of the Six Nations. And I would like to share with you some troubling developments over this past year related to Canada and space under the Liberal government of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And I'm going to share my slides with you now. Okay. Okay. So last year, in August of 2021, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Canada's Defense Minister at the time, Harjit Sajjan, signed a joint statement on the modernization of the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD. NORAD is a military partnership between the United States and Canada that was established in 1958. And it was founded to protect the North American continent from Soviet attacks. It is very much a Cold War institutions. Um, it is regrettably now being modernized and it's contributing to this new dangerous Cold War that we see unfolding. The United States and Canada are exaggerating the threats from Russia to justify spending billions of dollars to upgrade NORAD. Um, and this will only serve to enrich American and Canadian arms dealers. For NORAD modernization, Canada announced $5 billion uh, for the next five years and $38 billion over the next 20 years, even though Canada has failed to, to meet its climate targets. With all of this new funding, there will be new integrated interoperable capabilities from the seabed to space. So new radar stations, command and control upgrades, additional air-to-air -air refueling aircraft, advanced air-to-air -air missiles for fighter jets, upgrades to Canada, uh, Canadian Armed Forces infrastructure in the north, and additional funding to augment key space projects. And these are pri primarily related to satellites used, for, um, used in war for surveillance and targeting. And then five months later, in February of this year, the United States, Canada, Australia, France, Germany, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom released the new combined space operations, Vision 2031. And this is something that Dave just spoke about. Um, so it is a guiding document to maintain uh, space dominance by these six Western countries. At the same time of this sp space vision was announced, Canada also announced its intention to buy the F-35. So Canada is planning on buying 88 new Lockheed Martin stealth fighters for a cost of $19 billion. However, this deal hasn't been signed yet, and we are still working very hard to prevent it. And then at the height of uh, the summer, in July, when Canadians were on holiday and they were not playing, paying close attention to the news, the Department of National Defense announced Canada's version of Space Force. It's called Three a Canadian Space Division. It's a new division within the Royal Canadian Air Force, and it will be based at the Ottawa headquarters. And um, this new Canadian Space Division will be expanded with a doubling of personnel and a much bigger budget. So on top of uh, NORAD modernization, Vision 2031 and Canada's new Space Division is NATO. 10 months ago, in August, Canada, sorry, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg came to Canada for a three day visit. He went to the high north, Cambridge Bay and Nunavut, where there is the NORAD radar systems. He also went to Cold Lake, Alberta, which is the site of Canada's largest um, Air Force base and air weapons range and where the new F-35 fleet will be stationed uh, unless we can stop it. In media interviews while in Canada, Stoltenberg praised us for modernizing NORAD, buying fifth generation fighter jets and for increased military spending. He said Canada needed to do all of this in response to Russia's military buildup in the Arctic. During Stoltenberg's visit, he also raised the issue of ballistic missile defense. There continues to be intense pressure on the Canadian government uh, to participate in U.S. missile defense, which is extremely provocative, and we are trying to stop it. So Canada is spending billions of dollars to, mod, uh, to militarize space um, with 
the US and other NATO allies, and Canada is also spending billions of dollars to militarize the Arctic through NORAD. Yet there are severe social and environmental needs in this country that are being ignored. So Indigenous people in Canada's north have unsafe housing and they have disproportionate levels of poverty. Canada is also totally ill-prepared to deal with the climate emergency. Hurricane Fiona caused extreme damage to Atlantic Canada last month, and there are many coastal communities that are still without uh, power two weeks on. What Canada should do is withdraw from NORAD and NATO and work with the international community through the UN on a, on a plan for peace in space and peace in the Arctic. We need to cooperate with Russia and China, not antagonize them, provoke them and cause more conflict with them. Two weeks ago, during the high level debate um, of the UN General Assembly, Russia's Minister for Foreign Affairs, Sergei Lavrov, called for a comprehensive ban on the deployment of weapons in space. He mentioned the draft treaty that Russia and China have brought forward a number of times at the Conference of Disarmament. By contrast, the United States and Canada spent most of their UN speeches attacking Russia and they said very little about, they said nothing about space and very little about peace. I listened to many of the speeches from the Global South countries um, and almost all of them mentioned the need for, for peace, um, ending the war in Ukraine, reducing military spending and the need for global cooperation to achieve the UN sustainable development, development goals. I want to encourage you to listen to the UN speech by Costa Rica, a country without a military. The foreign affairs minister of Costa Rica, Tinico, called for the international community to have a gradual and phased reduction of military spending to uh, support a new UN agenda for peace and for a declaration of peace in the oceans. Two minutes. Finally. Two minutes. Finally, we held a little rally for Keep Space for Peace Week uh, this uh, past Thursday outside the NATO Association of Canada's off, uh, Canada office in downtown Toronto. We passed out leaflets and we collected signatures on letters that were sending to the Minister of National Defense and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, calling on them to have Canada be a leader for uh, peace in space and to stop the militarization and the weaponization of our fragile global commons. And I want to point out that um, in this picture is Dee Stapleton, a 93 year old uh, peace activist who is also on our webinar today. And I really appreciate her longtime support. And I uh, thank the Global Network for the opportunity to share this afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much, Tamara. Um, so again, if you want to put your questions in the chat, that would be great. Uh, you can also raise your hand. Uh, and uh, But for now, let me start with Sabrata. I want you to go back, if you would, and describe to us how India, which is becoming one of the most powerful countries in the world, with one of the largest economies, how is India likely to respond to these growing alliances that the United States is setting up? And I just want to uh, say that uh, tomorrow I leave for India to attend a space conference being organized by one of our board members, Dr. Aruna Kamila, at her law school at Hyderabad. And so I, it would be helpful to me, actually, to hear your thinking uh, on where India is going to go. If you could briefly comment on that. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> yes, well, this is a very complicated uh, situation with India. Um, but there is no doubt the trend is that um, India is definitely leaning towards the US because of its business ties, the power of the expatriate community here, 4 million Indians who are primarily either very strong, uh, staunch Trump supporters, or maybe some are Democrats. But in general, the uh, tremendous influence of the US-based Indian business community has a lot of influence on what the Modi government uh, does in, in foreign policy. So at, at the moment where 
you have this juxtaposition of India not allowing um, or, or, or not acquiescing to U.S. sanctions against Russia. They're getting uh, pretty cheap uh, oil and gas from Russia. So there is a transactional um, advantage there. And, um, and uh, at the same time, Modi kind of lectured uh, Putin at the uh, uh, summit of the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization in Samarkand, just happened a couple of weeks ago, that this is no time for war. Um, India was a very uh, strong member of the non-aligned movement and uh, had a very uh, independent foreign policy that was somewhat uh, closer to uh, the Soviet Union than the U United States for all of the Cold War period. But all of these things change dramatically. And India's problem that inside India, there is no opposition. There is not really a peace community that, um, and the forces uh, that are aligned to the left parties are very weak now. This uh, right-wing government is quite strong. And so I am not hopeful at, at, at all. I mean, there is another interest India has is, is, is in terms of its armaments, that it is heavily dependent on Russia uh, because of the uh, purchases they have made over the years and the, and the Russian government's easy terms for sales. So it's going to be um, very difficult. I think it will continue to be this sort of balancing act, uh, not here, not there. But I noticed when the external affairs minister, that is the foreign minister of India, who came to the UN General Assembly, then went to Washington, spent two days in with, uh, closeted with uh, Tony Blinken, having dinner at his home and so forth. He has no such relationship with the Russian uh, foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, or, or there is no such connection between Russia uh, and, and India, and of course the uh, China factor. So I'm skeptical, but we'll have to just watch and see how things develop, and a lot will depend on the outcome of the Ukraine war. Thank you, Subrata. I, I wonder if uh, some, our board uh, friend, uh, Sung Hee Choi from uh, uh, Jeju Island, South Korea, <clears throat> would tell us about the current war games that are going on with the US and the uh, South Korean government aimed at North Korea. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, uh, with the launch uh, of the uh, Insagel government, uh, I have seen the endless war exercise in the Pacific Ocean. And then it is about the uh, four years later that the, when uh, the US uh, a nuclear aircraft carrier is uh, having a war exercise with uh, United States, um, with South Korea. And then the uh, aircraft carrier is now coming to the sea of Jeju right now. Um, but for the, the space uh, issues, um, Please let me just, uh, you know, the update the uh, current situation just very briefly. Um, in recent years, uh, the South Korea and the United States politicians uh, talked about uh, the collaboration uh, in space. And um, as I know, not only in Jeju, but many parts of South Korea uh, and you know, the, the raided by the, you know, the space industry. And the, the back image, background image uh, of me uh, is the National uh, Satellite Integrate uh, Operations Center uh, recently opened in Jeju Island. I'm very sorry to bring uh, this image. And then uh, we have been uh, some in the holding tickets uh, in the Space Peace Week, Keep Space for Peace Week. Uh, my uh, focus is that the military, the military and the corporations are now cooperating in the name of space industry. That's what I understand. And the Jeju Island governor 
is recently talking about uh, the rocket uh, launch uh, site uh, and the space training center in Jeju Island. So the, a few days ago, um, you know, the, the, we organized the press conference uh, in the, with the core statement signed by 19 uh, groups. Uh, yes, I have many things, uh, you know, to share, but it's, it would be later. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sung Hee. Um, Tamara, there's a question about what could be done to strengthen the peace movement across Canada. Would you comment on that, please? Well, thanks for the question. And I see that it's from Ed Lehman, who is very active in Regina with the Regina Peace Council. So two years ago, we set up the Canada-wide Peace and Justice Network to try to reinvigorate and strengthen and unify the peace movement in the country. I'll put a link uh, for that in the chat. So we are doing our best with very limited resources to, to try to uh, you know, bring peace out into the to the public. We unfortunately don't have many political allies. We don't have members of parliament that we can work with closely on on peace issues, which is which is really problematic. And um, and you know, often we get ignored in the media, but we keep trying. Um, I found that. Uh, doing some disruption sometimes can get attention to our causes and to get us into the media. But, um, you know, we're continuing to work. We do, uh, um, it, we are participating, Canada is participating, for instance, in the big UNAC, the United um, Anti-War Coalition in the United States has done a, a call to action back to the streets and endless wars. Um, and so we're gonna be out in solidarity across Canada with UNAC from October 15th to 22nd. We're having a, a series of rallies across the country and the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War is having a big teach-in. So that information is up on our website, the Canada Wide Peace and Justice Network. And you know, we keep we keep trying. We keep trying. And it's great for us to be in solidarity with the global network and with peace groups around the world. Many of many of them, you know, on this call today. There's another question about, uh, are we in contact with any peace groups in Russia? Uh, just actually in the last few days, I was in contact with the leader of uh, Russian Veterans for Peace, uh, the uh, one of the key founders of uh, US Veterans for Peace recently died, Jerry Genesio. Some of you might know uh, Veterans for Peace was founded in Maine. Uh, he was a, uh, a Mainer. But anyway, I sent the uh, information to the leader of Veterans for Peace in Russia. He was very sad to hear it because it was Jerry Genesio that brought the Russian uh, veterans into Veterans for Peace. When we had our global network uh, uh, study tour to Russia, in 2019, which Kathy and Alex, who were on the call, were there, as well as Mary Beth and uh, a few others, uh, Sabrata, and uh, uh, anyway, uh, they uh, the, several of their leaders came and met with us at our hotel in uh, Moscow. And one thing uh, this Alexander, the president, said to us, he was a Afghanistan war veteran. Most of the members of Russian Veterans for Peace were involved in the Afghanistan war. And he said, we clearly are opposed to war. We don't wanna see any war, but and this was 2019, remember, if the United States and NATO continue expanding the way they are now, if they continue attacking the Russian ethnic citizens in the Donbass, who since the US sponsored coup in 2014, more than 14,000 have been killed and more than 34,000 wounded. If this continues, he said, Russia will have to respond. And he said, we will support our government uh, against Ukraine and NATO. Uh, so uh, they take that very strong line. Um, anyway, let me go from there. Let me see if 
Kuhan first, then Agneta, and then Dave uh, want to make any comments uh, at this point in time. Kuhan first, you, anything? No, thanks. Oh, I wasn't prepared for this. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I would like some to put some questions to what I said about the North and Sweden in particular development in this uh, dangerous militarization. Uh, it's really, it's really a shock for all of us, actually that Sweden has now applied to join NATO. Why we in this country, I am not at all sure that they understand that if we are a NATO country, we don't decide anything about our military policy. It will be decided in, in Brussels maybe, and particularly by the US. So. I think most of the people and in the world are not aware of how they have, um, I should say, I call it a coup d'etat in our country. It was never ever discussed among any. Suddenly the government said, we will apply for joining NATO. That was all. So that's what I could, I wanted to add. In could you say this something, discussion. Agnita, could you say something about the present uh, thinking of, you know, the average uh, Swedish citizens about this uh, joining NATO? Is there much, uh, 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 are people upset about it or protesting against it? Or? <laughs> well, the sad thing to say, there is a strategy from the power and the media. We don't talk about it. We don't talk about this. So uh, you can hardly ever see anything about NATO in the uh, newspapers, actually. And um, what I would also add is that it has been, a I think I said it when I spoke, a furious um, whipping up of fear uh, towards Russia since the 14th of February this year. So I, I must say, I, I'm really scared of the, and one thing is that the peace movement is divided. Uh, half of the peace movement, if there is anything left or the organizations are um, supporting the US policy in Ukraine, for instance. And we who are, who see something else, we see what began in 2014 with the overthrow of the government and putting in really Nazi are ruling around the entire Ukraine. This is not mentioned in our media. Very few know about it. Uh, and so I have a ambition to, I'm busy talking about what really happened during the eight years of war uh, towards this, the, the people in Donbass. When so many was dead, as you said, 14,000 died and there are, still dying. So I think we are in a historical moment. We have never experienced that the media is so prepared to drive us into NATO. I think it is historical. We have never experienced this type of media hysteria. Uh, and I think I'm talking about the Western, US, Europe, Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, 
the so-called white Ang Anglo-Saxon people, you can see a big difference in Africa and also India and in China, of course, and in Latin America, you have quite another policy and uh, not like, example, Sweden, that we, if we had a nuclear bomb, I'm sure the sentiment would be, we, we have to bomb Russia. It's, it's, it's crazy, it's really crazy. And I'm so afraid of the, what is going on and most afraid of we are not discussing it. I, I mean, on the media, silent, and we are few in the peace movement who arrange small demonstrations. But what, what really was uh, encouraging was the big demonstration, if you have heard of it in, in the US, in Czech Republic, I think two big demonstrations and in many other places in Europe. Yeah. So they have started to wake up. Yeah, but Poland you. is really stronghold for the US. But I'm not sure that Germany is interested in this horrible development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Czech Republic has had, I think, about three big demonstrations, 70,000 people each time. Uh, I, on YouTube, I daily watch protests from Germany, small towns, big cities, day, night, weekends, weekdays. Germany is really, really, really turning people out. Uh, you might go on YouTube and just search, and uh, it's really fascinating to see how much stuff is happening there. Dave, could you... Uh, hold on, Bernie. Uh, let me go to Dave first. Dave, could you speak about the latest in, uh, in the UK, you have a new prime minister, your economy is in big trouble. They say that all the pubs are gonna be closing soon. And, uh, and what about Ukraine? Is the new prime minister gonna continue this situation? Yes, basically. Uh, the new prime minister is, you know, it's unbelievable that we should have a worse prime minister than we had before, but this one seems to be even worse than the last one. And the last one, as you probably are aware, was going over to Ukraine, shaking hands with Zelensky uh, and increasing the propaganda, the anti-Russian propaganda. Um, I guess when there's a war on, you always get propaganda, especially if your country is fighting in a war. But this is ridiculous that we get now. It's very much like uh, Agneta was saying about Sweden. It's very much the same here. You can't speak out and give an alternative view of why Russia is doing what it's doing or, or anything about the... Um, we see war crimes committed by Russia all the time. We don't see any war crimes being committed by Ukraine, although we know, you know that is happening. Uh, and it's just terribly... Um, I mean, one of the things I think we're trying to focus on in some conferences and, and discussions is this idea of a hybrid warfare, which is includes, includes propaganda and political activism as a part of generating uh, conflict and creating the conflict going and part of a war fighting strategy. And, and that's what we're seeing at the moment. Uh, we also now looks like we'll be hosting American nuclear weapons again, there's, there's, the silos are being prepared for that in Lake and Heath, in the airfield in Lake and Heath. We've got these F-35s, now two, the same as uh, Canada. It's um, steadily getting worse. We're increasing also, this new prime minister has increased our defense spending to 3% of G GDP. Not that the GDP is very high these days, I guess, but still, I mean, that's still an increase in, uh, in militarism. Um, and there's just not, there's no alternative voice. Even the Labour Party, which was once headed by um, Jeremy Corbyn, who many of you will have heard of, and was totally anti-nuclear, anti-nuclear weapons and anti-war. Um, but they got rid of him. Uh, he was too, too radical, I guess, was asking too many questions. And um, now it's just uh, going along with the same old line as everyone else. So 
we've got an awful lot to kind of try to overturn here. I mean, we have everywhere, I know, but it's it's a big struggle, but we've got to we've got to do it and we've got to try and bring other I thought I saw in the chat about the discussion, a little bit of a discussion about bringing in other aspects like climate change. There are links to all of these different um, other campaigns and we have to draw the people's attention to those links and work together with these other organizations, because otherwise I can't see how we're going to get out of this terrible mess that we're in. Um, and the, the earth it looks like do, like it's doomed unless we can really create a U-turn uh, at this moment. Sorry, it's a bit depressing, but um, it's actually wonderful to meet people like we have on the call here because, you know, that gives you hope. That makes you realize that there are people out there who do believe in peace and, um, uh, and security in the right form. Uh, and that's what keeps us going. So I think... Um, you know, it's it's depressing, but we've got to fight on and we've got to make the changes that are needed. Thank you for all that you do, everyone. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Bernie Meyer, you wanted to say something? We have just a few minutes left. Yes, uh, thanks, Bruce. Um, I've been involved with the war, anti-war stuff starting from the 60s and with nukes since the 74. And uh, I know very little about any acknowledgement about space in the U.S. peace movement. So I was wondering, Bruce, if you could give your sense of things in the U.S. Uh, in terms of the connections with the peace movement. All right, Bernie, I'll try. Um, and I'll kind of use that to kind of close up. Uh, first, let me say thank you to everybody for being a part of this. Uh, this is our last event during Keep Space for Peace Week that has been going on uh, during the past week. We've had a lot of activity, particularly in India. Uh, one of our dear friends uh, in India is a former regional technical school director. His name is Prabhakar. He lives in Visakhapatnam, and he's been uh, organizing every day during the past week uh, going as far away as 200 kilometers away. He's retired now. He has time. He knows all these teachers at these engineering schools, uh, high schools and colleges. So he's arranged to go to these different schools and spoken to many, many students at a time, uh, bringing them our message. So uh, I put a lot of the pictures he sent me on my Facebook page. Uh, please take a look if you're interested. Uh, but anyway, um, we do have some serious problems in this country. Uh, last, uh, about four weeks ago, we have, every month we have a potluck supper here in the town I live in Brunswick. And uh, we had this potluck supper and one guy walks in, he's supposedly a peace activist. And he said to me, as soon as he walked in, he walks up to me and says, you know, Bruce, if you'd stop talking about the Nazis in Ukraine, people would take you more seriously. Well, you know, I told him, well, you're entitled to your opinion and I'm entitled to mine. But this really indicates what we're dealing with today. I don't think this person is ignorant. I think this person, I can't speak to uh, this person's motivation, but obviously this person is denying reality. And, uh, uh, one of the things I think is a serious problem is that we have a democratic, a democratic administration and we have Democrats controlling the House and the Senate. In fact, in 2019, when the legislation came up before the House of Representatives to create the Space Force during the Trump administration, the Democrats overwhelmingly voted for it. In fact, all they asked for was to call it the Space Corps, like the Marine Corps, rather than the Space Force. That was the only thing the Democrats said. So uh, when you have a Democrat in office, you tend to see that large portions of the peace movement peel off and stop working uh, to resist the, uh, the uh, warmongering of the current administration. I remember when Obama was president, you remember he had the drone Tuesdays 
the kill Tuesdays where he would decide who they were going to kill with drones that day. Well, there was a poll taken by the Washington Post at that time asking self-identified Democrats, uh, do you support Obama's drone program? And 70% of self-identified liberal Democrats said, yes, we do indeed support uh, President Obama. And I noticed just about a month ago, a similar poll came out asking again, Democrats, do you support Biden's war on Ukraine? And again, 70% of self-identified registered Democrats said they do support uh, Biden's war on Ukraine. So this is a real problem for us, is that you know tomorrow, if we had Trump back in again, I promise you, suddenly our ranks would swell again with many Democrats coming to complain about the Republicans. Uh, I noticed a comment a minute ago from Don Smith saying that, uh, that in fact, many of the people in the Congress today that are voting against this continued funding for the war uh, uh, in Ukraine are coming from Republicans. Uh, and I saw an article the other day exploring why are Republicans beginning to vote and speak out against the war in Ukraine. And the article concluded that because their base, their grassroots base is becoming increasingly opposed to the war in Ukraine. So this is quite a switch. So I think one of the things that we in the peace movement have to do is begin to find ways to reach out to good hearted uh, Republicans who are becoming anti-war uh, and finding a way to work with them. Uh, we don't have to agree on every issue, but we can begin to work on something together. I think it, it would be an important step forward. Well, we're just about out of time. Again, thank you all very much. I thank Will Griffin again for uh, doing all the tech work. And uh, we will be posting this. Uh, uh, will is gonna, he's uh, gonna send me the link. I'll post it on our, uh, global network uh, uh, and my personal Facebook page. I'll put it on my blog, which is called Organizing Notes. So uh, you can uh, uh, help pass it on, if you will, so other people can see all of this information. I thank all of our speakers and I thank all of you who have uh, been such great supporters for the global network for a long time. Uh, good luck to everybody. And as I like to say, get organized. Bye-bye. Have a good trip, Bruce. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, safe travels.